So to begin, thank you, Miss Amy Vorpal, uh, for coming and being on uh, the Delver channel to talk about your new project, Goblin Mode. Do you want to kind of just pitch it to the audience, time to talk about? Yeah, it sure. Is? Thank you so much for having me. First of all, um, I yeah. So Goblin Mode is a TTRPG. Uh, storytelling game show um, <laughs> and it is basically the players in the game are all minions in an overlord's dungeon who wake up uh, to find that the dungeon has been completely decimated by adventuring heroes and it's their story of how they deal with that and discovering their own agency having been pawns for the evil overlord for about five years. Well, one of the things I noticed immediately upon watching the first episode is that you kind of put that emphasis on heroes with the quotation marks uh, each time. So I'm kind of curious, what inspired you to tell a story from the perspective of a minion? Is it is there any media out there that kind of like influenced that at all? So <laughs> this is <laughs> what actually happened was uh, Dan Casey at, at Nerdist and Geek and Sundry came to me and this was the pitch. So he was like, hey, do you want to dungeon master a game where we're minions? And I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> so I didn't come up with it. And I have to give all the credit uh, to Dan for at least the theme and the uh, the concept. Um, he said that he had wanted to play this for a really long time. Like it had been something that had been cooking in his mind for about 10 years. And I think the reason I accepted it was it's rife for comedy. Like it is just one of those, well, shenanigans are gonna happen. Uh, and and they, they, they also named it Goblin Mode. Like this was all very, this was all, I, I don't wanna say it was packaged because I got to do, build the world and do whatever I wanted to do. It was just that the the goblin mode and the concept was uh predetermined in the best way possible but yeah okay fair enough you, you mentioned that you built the world so the world of sundaros if i'm pronouncing that correctly yeah is yeah. that entirely your own creation um i would say uh as as it stands yeah mostly again uh sundaros um the lore about three paragraphs of lore and a few like three factions about a, a page and a half of a google doc was sent to me like hey if you want to use this um this is it's basically like how they pitched it how they were able to get it made um or how they were able to get it funded and then they brought me on board after that but they were very clear like this is what we came up with if you want to use it go for it if you don't want to use it that's fine too and i'm very lucky because it was dan casey and um, Amy Ratcliffe, who is a Nerdist writer and a writer of her own rights, but um, yeah, they're just excellent storytellers. So a lot of what they, at least the lore and, and, and the, these like names of the factions uh, were very playable. And so I was like, okay, I'll start, I'll start there. And then, and then a lot of the, I mean, most of the geographic locations and the map and all of that, that 100% um, was, yeah, just something that I took and ran with. Um, they, they yeah but the this like history of where it's a it's a world without gods um highly technical and 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 it also was a world where these minions are uh just kind of waking up going daddy or where's daddy <laughs> you know uh that all that all was uh pitched to me but yeah um coming up with the world was mostly maps uh, and geography that i thought would be really fun to explore in a 20 episode situation um like my when i do dm that's the first thing i decide is like well what would be a cinematic set piece what would be a cinematic setting for people to explore that is that, that continues to be different you know um yeah Absolutely. Yeah, Fair enough. That makes sense. I, I fully agree with that, as you can see from my map wall. Yeah. Oh, you like maps, do you? I, I have probably about 20 or so maps, all from across fiction. I have my home state of Arizona drawn up like a Tolkien map. Oh, my God. Uh, That's how you know when a novel is going to be good, is if they have a map in the front. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. I literally, My last interview that I did probably like... Um, two months ago, one of the things I said was, if you go to the beginning of a book and it has the worst map you've ever seen, you know it's about to be one of the best books you've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> or, like, or I actually, one of the other ones was, uh, if you go and you find a play or like a, a reader made map online, that's how you know it's really good because the world is so pervasive that it's stuck in somebody's mind enough to make a map for it. Oh, and that's dope. Fully agree with what you're saying. Maps are the <laughs> gateway drug into fantasy. Yes. Um, and I also noticed that you mentioned where to go. Uh, so in, in kind of 
getting this pitch to you, uh, in your normal DMing experience, are you usually the DM that kind of takes what the players want and then creates something around that? Or do you usually take a lot of creative freedom to kind of shape what the story's gonna be beforehand? Okay, I think I think it's really tricky because when you're, I mean, for a show, for a, a show that's gonna be published, you do have to pre-plan. You have to prep, there are like assets that need to be done. There, there's like um, art, there's like, you know, characters, NPCs that might need art. So for this, for, for shows, it's normally like, um, yeah, a bunch of planning. Now, I will say for this show, uh, while I did, was able to prep the geography, where they went and in what order was immediately messed up. <laughs> like sure. the way they chose to go, it was like they, the, I mean, when episode three is out, you'll see that they, they choose a place to go. I had planned for them to go to somewhere else. The place they actually choose to go, I had planned for episode 16 and 17 and 18. And it was like, okay, I guess, I guess I'm no longer in charge. Like, so that being said, the assets and stuff were prepped for it. And I, I did have to play like a different adventure than I thought we would play there because they just weren't ready and they didn't have like this information that I thought they would have. <laughs> um, you know, you can always move stuff around, but like it, it was, it, it, it continued to be like, you know, I, I think every Dungeon Master's experience is like, how did we get here? Um, oh, players, you know, and so I think that definitely still happened even in this show. Um, I know that there there have been some shows where actually there is no freedom like that. They have to, you have to play on the sets that were built, like the minis and all of that. Uh, but for my, for home games and stuff like that, I, I try... I mean, even for goblin mode, it's like you can prep the beginning and then you can kind of have an idea of what a final, final, final culmination will be, um, even if the the like whether it's good or bad, like whether they decide that this person or this faction or this entity that they want to battle or kill or or whatever or get like if they want this prize thing. Um, it, it could be for many different reasons, but you're like, I think they're probably gonna end up on some level discovering something like this. So you get the beginning and the ending. And then and then in terms of the middle, um, it's more like plan for the next one because you don't know what's gonna happen. Like how much can you actually, how much can you actually predetermine uh, what the players are, are going to want to do? I mean, most of the time it's like, you introduce a dumb NPC and they're like, oh shoot, I love this NPC. I, I We must protect them and get them back to their homeland. And you're like, oh, the NPC that I just, Jim, Jim, do you mean Jim? Jim, the little, Jim, the little cobalt that like didn't have a personality before five seconds ago. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We're going to do adventure for Jim. Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah. Oh, there's my windy answer. There was a beginning, there was like a semblance of a geography at the end and maybe how it would work out. And then, um, and then they went all over the place. Oh, oh and then, um, we do have guests, we do have guest players. So those were thrown in really, I, they tried to give me as much notice as possible. And sometimes that just wasn't possible and it was like oh i found out the night before or something and so that changed what i wanted to do with the adventure the night before um we shot 20 episodes in six weeks it was so it was really slapdash um but it but not like thrown together like we had i mean i don't want it to sound like oh i didn't think of anything and everything was improvised a lot of it was improvised but 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 as far as planning um it was like we, we were pivoting pretty consistently Okay, fair enough. And, and and with Goblin Mode so far, from what I've seen from episode one and two, it is theater of the mind when it comes to how they in, interact yeah. with the environment. All theater of the mind, yeah. Was there a certain freedom in kind of not having to, as you said, like have these set pieces that they would have to go to because they were prepared and being able to kind of off the cuff improvise? Yeah, I think, I think yes, it, it would have been a very different adventure if, if there were um, minis. And we didn't, I guess the, the way that all of us for interact together, we do, we have all done a lot of improv comedy and and even for combat, look, I, I, I'm of two minds. Like sometimes a, a map can really assist with, um, you know, distance for one, when you're casting spells and, and doing melee or ranged attacks. And then, uh, and then in another world, it's like, oh, well, sometimes, Sometimes theater of the mind just gives you, sometimes it can be, I don't know, sometimes it can be yeah, a little more, a little more freeing or sometimes it can be a little more 
uh, it, like feel, make you feel like you're in a prison because you're constantly going, wait, am I 30 feet away? Am I 120? Is 120 feet? And you're like, oh my gosh. Um, so I I enjoyed playing it with this group of people as theater of the mind. That was that was always that felt like that was always what it was going to be. Um, you also notice that we never say we're playing D and D five E. We pretty much are playing D and D five E. But the press and and how we're communicating it, it's like no, we're we're playing like our version. And it's mostly because um, there was a bunch of homebrew in a way that was gen generated towards theater of the mind that technically i guess i could write out and print and like publish or whatever that would take a whole lot more time than <laughs> you know the game that i ran you know uh and the player characters the classes were homebrewed skeleton undead classes were homebrewed as well I was gonna say, yeah, the the skeleton uh, undead, and then the I think it was College of Clipboard of Middle Management. Uh, yeah, that that was a joke. Uh, that was not that's not printed anywhere, and it must be. You know what I it mean? Has to, um, it has to, it has to be. That. Yeah, this is a new subclass that we've just got to lean into. <laughs> they're adding it to the new PHB right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, those poor people. Uh, speaking of though, because uh, you you mentioned how this kind of went off the rails in episode three, to, or like yeah. you, you were suddenly in an area that you didn't expect to be um yep. had you played with uh danielle jason and dan beforehand no okay. like technically no i haven't played gosh the only person i think i would have played with is danielle but i actually now have i worked together with them and and like hung out and like gone to parties and been friends with them yes but but playing an actual ttrpg game nope Never have, never have. Dan and I and Jason all worked at Nerdist and Geek and Sundry in that one in one building called Legendary Digital Networks, and uh, everyone had you know different roles there. So we had all done a lot of stuff together, um, different projects here and there, mostly one-offs, mostly digital, mm -hmm. and. And then Danielle and I know each other from the same like nerdy internet space, not necessarily at Geek and Sundry and, and Nerdist, but like yeah, around around you know being hosts, actors, and writers, uh, and nerds, baby. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like you, you will find your people. That's that's what's true. Uh, they brought a lot to the they brought a lot to the game too. And now looking back, it's kind of like, well, I can't imagine this show with literally anyone else. Absolutely, I feel that. Uh, I, I, and speaking of the show itself, I am a little curious because I feel like every dungeon master puts something special into a campaign that they run, whether it's on screen or not. For goblin mode, for you personally, what does it mean? If, is there any kind of meaning behind it? A greater message? Something you want oh. to take away? <laughs> you know, sometimes you just make the art and the and then the people tell you what it means. Um, <laughs> what does it mean to me? What does Goblin Moon mean to me? I think I think uh, like it's it's I don't think it was uh, ever really that unclear that this was a story about agency. Um, that being said, it was it was really interesting. I don't know if this is what it meant to me, but I the challenge for me was going, these are minions. Um, they're basically video game code. They're the guys in the dungeon whose job are to walk two steps, halt, turn right, walk four steps. Don't look left and right. You know, you're only gonna, but counting, timing, stepping, um, or, or hiding out somewhere to, unless a trigger happens and then they burst. It's like, they're the video game code. Um, now, they also must be, they also must guide the adventure. They also must be the the protagonists. So, so what what is that world? You know, like is it a world where everyone's going, "What's a freaking skeleton doing in my shop?" You know, or is it is it is it a world where you know they're they're a little bit more accepted, maybe maybe generically hated just because they are monsters and even other monsters don't really necessarily get along like it was it was a really it was a really weird needle to thread um until until we landed until i learned who the characters were we did play a session zero but i think i i really leaned on them for like how are you interacting in this space i'm going to put some parameters on it so it's not just like well other monsters are just going to eat everybody and 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 adventurers are just going to kill you like if you're in a town that everyone's just gonna kill you like that feels so uh like not a great story um it's like it's like extraordinary racism you know 
Yeah. And I, I, I don't, I didn't want to play that, but I did thread the needle of like, you know, the new, I think, I think I did a good job of like the nuances of what these people as protagonists could do versus what, wh where they would even be like, like what their surroundings and what their reality would actually be. Um, the first few episodes, I think we were all figuring that out together uh, as they, but that was as they were taking ownership of the, their protagonism um and and then we were off to the races and look at some point you are playing that you are playing like oh yeah people do actually want you to die so um you're playing that but but not all the time so that what it means to me is like oh man i don't even know i it means a really fun game really fun people a story to tell um and oh and you know Maybe this is too spoilery, but but when I it's a it's there is a bit of a, a mystery to it too because as as they're exiting the dungeon, they don't know what the world is. The audience doesn't know what the world is. It, it's not like I'm able to, which I do a lot in my in my campaigns, is like pull from player characters' backstories and histories, and they were like, no, we want to be a blank slate, including because if you're an undead skeleton, that means you did have a life in the past so they didn't even want there's like a part where it was like choose what race you used to be they're like we don't even want to choose what race we used to be and so i was like oh then i free reign to give flashbacks like and and to to name your character's race and to name like what happened and how you're here and so i i was able to build in some some backstories and, and some mysteries there so they're like uncovering their past at least the undead people are they're uncovering their past as they're moving forward in the world too um in a way that i think that if they had stayed in the dungeon i don't think they would have been like wait i recognize that you know so it was a lot of it was a lot of there was a lot on my shoulder to uh to introduce to them like oh and you're not aware of this but this is true and you're not aware of this but this is true and they gobbled it up they and they wanted it that way too which is different from my normal campaigns. A lot of a lot of times people be like, no, 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 this happened to my father and this happened to my family and this happened to my, you know, wizarding cult and this is what's going on in my land. And then and then I'm able to build like an adventure from kind of to, you know, mess with that. <laughs> and this was like, oh, you just want you guys just want to generically be messed with. OK, I can also do that. <laughs> It's always, it's always nice to get that free reign as a dungeon master to be able to create things for your players that they don't they necessarily won't know about. I, I like my, my players half the time uh, they'll give me their backstories and then I'll say, hey, I'll ask a clarifying question and they won't have an answer. I'm like, I, mean, let, I, I got something. Let me let me throw something. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it, it's always fun to do that. And, and speaking of that moving through goblin mode, kind of learning to run a game like that, in addition to that. Were there any lessons that you learned and kind of take away from this experience of running for these players in this world and with this kind of uh, blank slate backstory generation model? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that it's a lesson. I, I but here, here's what I don't, I don't know if it's a lesson I learned. I, but I will. There's a couple of there's a couple of things that like I, I don't know. I would definitely do again. So. Um, one, um, when when the players, when the guests came on, I gave them stat blocks as opposed to character sheets. I'm always gonna do that forever and ever. If it's like a one-off person, um, just because I think that's way, even if they're spell casting stat blocks, that's way more manageable for them. It also is manageable, I can control it. I can also always add in a version of an attack, just homebrew like a cool attack that can happen once a day or like once in this adventure that's gonna make them shine as the guest and, and um, you know, beyond the fuck, the fuck, like longest emails you've ever heard. Um, I, I would send them so much lore, God bless all of them. Um, and they, they, they did pick it up and I knew I could trust them all with it, but, and, and ha ha ha, I can't, I can't say who the guests are, but they're going to be great. Um, and, but as, uh, but I, as I sent them the stop block, I'd be like, Hey, and check out this one attack. Like, this is the thing that I think might be like, might be galvanizing in the adventure, at least for your character, just to, to cement like what we know about them. If you want, like, obviously, but, but I, I viewed them as like extensions of me of just like, oh, that's an NPC that I won't have to play. And if I front load them with a lot, they're going to feel 
um, more engaged in in the improv and, and conversation and directing the adventure as opposed to going, okay, I'm new, like, what do I do now? And it's like, just, you know, press those video game control buttons, um, especially in like a combat situation. Another thing, another thing that was so, <laughs> Well, one thing I'll, I'll just say, I always prep. I know some dungeon masters are like, I don't prep. I don't need to prep. I can just show up and they'll tell me what they want to do. <laughs> not me. And I'm never going back. Like, like I never have, I've never not prepped and I never will because I think it's, it's, it's less about like improv or whatever. And it's more about, I get delighted when I'm like, I built a playground. Do you want to play on my playground? Like there's, there's that vibe that I bring to it that I wouldn't have if it was like, uh, what do you want to do? Like, I, I don't, I, what I personally wouldn't enjoy it as much, even if they mess with everything and, and are like, no, I don't want to play on your playground. I want to go do this. It's like, well, the playground moved and now you're <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and then the third thing that, um, I don't think anyone knows, but I was given two story producers and mostly their jobs were to just track names or like just dumb stuff that literally anyone said, you know, like College of Clipboard, just in case we wanted to go back or reference that in like another episode. But you know, when you're improvising and you're like, I don't know, this this NPC, I, I wasn't planning on, I planned on introducing you to these 12 NPCs. Oh no, not this one that I just kind of came up with. And he's a bush. Yeah, I guess he's a bush and he's got stats now. Oh, what the heck? <laughs> um, and and you're like doing that stuff and they're there to just track that, which is a godsend, by the way. Then one of them, was so invested that after every show, after every recording, like set day, we would jump on the phone and her her name is uh, Rin Ehlers Sheldon and we have become really close friends. But she also, I would say, like I tried to get her like a bump up of a credit because I would consider her a writer as well. Like she had a lot of input on what happens next because we shot sometimes, we never shot, we we had scheduled back to back, like like days where we shot this and then and then the next one and i said i just don't want to do back to back because i need to write in between because they're not following what i think they're following mm -hmm. and so i would like i i need an extra day because set days are long like they're they're minimum eight hours and and so like when am i prepping like like and i and, and it is so recorded and so good and the the visual quality is so good that i wanted the narrative quality to also be good so so anyway, we never shot back to back and, and on those uh, uh, d days in between, um, Rin would actually, the way she helped the most was to clarify uh, objectively the player's motivations. Because when I'm in it, you know, like I'm, you know, you're dancing 10 different dances and when she would be like, no, 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 this person actually really likes it when you do this. I'm like, really? what and and they were like yeah they get this huge smile on their face and i was like oh i must have been looking at literally like two other people or my computer or like i didn't notice that so she was very good at, at telling me like no, no no this is this is what they're motivated by um and uh and yeah you can you can kind of lose that if you're if you're in your if you're in your prep you know yeah so, that was cool Absolutely. So those are the three. It's not like what I learned, but it was like those were the gifts I think that uh, that I'll be taking with me. Although, can I take two story producers with me <laughs> at every game? Like, I don't know, but highly recommend it if you can do it. <laughs> uh, at the time of recording this, I'm trying to get one of my friends into that role for my campaign because I'm oh, like, awesome. I, I just I need help tracking all this stuff. Uh, but yeah, we, actually, we we stream our campaign weekly and there was a time recently where we went back to a place that we hadn't been in a long time and I went back and watched our episode and I was like oh like there's so much that I forgot and like so yeah. much I didn't even realize was there so having the ability to kind of look at the actual like event or have somebody watching it is it's unimaginably helpful so yes props to them. A hundred, I mean because at the end of a normal D&D session I'll look down at my notes and it's like one NPC's name yep. and you're like <laughs> Oh, Bruno, my notes for the whole session were Bruno. Okay. <laughs> I guess we're playing Bruno next session. <laughs> it, it makes me so happy to know that I'm not the only one. <laughs> like when do you have time? When do you have time to like think about what they did with their freaking rat gas? I don't know. Yeah. We got to move, uh, you know? 
Uh, and I was going to ask as well, uh, something I, I kind of noticed only last night after I sent you these questions originally. Um, you posted something about, I think it was Dungeon Master School or Dungeon Master Graduation. Yes. Was that happening synonymous to this or? Uh, it happened. No, I started this that four months ago. We shot about five months ago, but I, I on a whim was like, could I teach Dungeon Mastering? Um, because in my mind, it's 30 skills all in one that I just happen to, you know, have um, training in acting, writing, directing, game designer. Um, I mean, technically producing too, uh, but narrative storytelling, like any version of that. Um, and then and then, yeah, I mean, game designer, game mechanics, all of that. Uh, that's not 30, but, you know, you get it. It's like a million. Oh, improv, like just improv in general. And I had like had years of training of all of those and experience and professional experience. And I was like, could I, but could I teach all, all of those things in one as a dungeon master school? And it turns out I can, uh, it was nice. a four month, it was a four month little program. I did, um, about eight people, nine people were in it. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we had a great time. I think they, they all massively improved. I think it was really nice for them I, I it was just an experiment I didn't advertise it very much definitely wasn't on socials I just kind of sent out one email to my my um, audience who subscribes to my newsletter and was like hey this and nine people actually ten people show, signed up and and uh, one had to leave because of family stuff but it was like they they all I, I didn't I barely even said what it was I was I made no promises because I was like this is just an experiment because I I have some thoughts. I've analyzed what I do in a very like objective way. And I'm wondering if I can teach it. And they're like, yeah, they, and they did great. And I could, and it's like, it was very successful. So I, I'm considering, I'm really strongly considering doing it again, but it, it did end time of this recording, like two days, two to two nights ago. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Yeah. I saw, I saw it on there. That was, it looked interesting. Were these people that had never done it before? They ranged. Yeah. Yeah, many of them hadn't. One had uh, one had DM'd for four years, but just wanted to know what was going on in my brain of like how I did things. Um, and uh, but yeah, and and then but yeah, I would say I would say about most of them ha hadn't really done it before. M and then one person had never played D and D before, so wow. <laughs> it oh, was like. Was I don't know that I would. I, yeah, I think I would. I think next next round. I mean, that was just a, a bit of a heavier lift. Um, not not for me. Like I I think playing D and D is like you do three things and you rinse repeat. But they they got kept getting in their head about like how little they knew. And I'm like, yeah, but you, it's not the rules. Like like stop reading the book. You know. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, one of my uh, so my my degree is in communication studies and I'm finishing up this semester, but oh, cool. a, a lot of my end of graduate or end of undergraduate work is in communication and D and D, and the the way I kind of tell people is ninety percent communication, five percent imagination, five percent rules. You could throw the rules out; it's still yeah. gonna be an incredible game. Well, I don't think people know this, but like. Because I use the DMG as a textbook kind of thing, mm -hmm. but we bounced around, and the way that it's written is true. The format is, or the order—it's actually well, well written, but the order it's in is really weird. Um, and only about I think, if I remember correctly, thirty pages or thirty of the three hundred are dedicated to rules, yeah. and and then there's like, or maybe it's fifteen pages are rules, and then thirty pages are like, but if you don't like those rules, here are some other yeah, suggestions. Just throw it out. <laughs> And in the beginning, it's like seven pages of what is a dungeon master? Here's what you do. That's excellent. Mm. The next section is deities. Okay. <laughs> so what? Like if someone, if someone wanted to just be like, I'd love to play D and D. Oh, this is what a dungeon master is. Great. Deities. Okay. Like, and we're here. It's like, how? But what about? Do we roll dice? Dice and rolling isn't until like two page two hundred or like you know, it's it's bizarre. Anyway, so I have I have notes, but I think that was written for people who like the way that you play D and D and the way you become a dungeon master is you don't play for ten years because you can't find anybody. So what do you do in the meantime? You world build because anyone can world build like a gremlin in a corner, isolated <laughs> and typing on their computer, and then finally you find your 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 group. Uh, 200 pages later and that's when you start actually playing the game uh, and that i don't think is the the general demographic of people who want to start dming these days so I, I don't know yeah all of that like philosophy and theory i was like well could i just teach people like 
there's like there's like yeah five steps to being a dungeon master and then rinse repeat um and a lot of them don't have anything to do with rules so fair enough and also uh it looks like we're running out of time on zoom which i didn't know how to timer uh okay so, do, you, do you want to restart uh i think we should be good uh, let's get one more question and then we'll see if we need to restart. But okay. I think we should be good. I, okay. I did want to ask, so Geek and Sundry, where this is being hosted, is the original home to a lot of legendary shows like Critical Role, other Sagas of Sundry productions. For you coming into that space with Goblin Mode and working with the team to create it, what was that like? What was the feeling of like of doing this? Oh, well, I don't know if you know this, but I was at Geek and Sundry yes. forever. Oh, you did know that? Yeah. So, so yeah, it was just the returning home. It was like, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I worked at Nerdist and Geek and Sundry and Alpha when that was a thing, and that was my full time job for a long time. And I, I, I called it. I they used the whole buffalo of Amy. I was a writer. I was a producer um, for their variety shows and comedy shows, but I also was a dungeon master and a and a RPG player. And this was just like um, Dan is Dan and a few other people are kind of the. The skeleton crew that are left from there and so it did feel like oh we get to hang out and like make stuff again together this is just like the old days um i knew i knew a little bit of the history so there wasn't like this pressure to be sagas of sundry as we know it with like these huge sets and like escape room vibes and mm -hmm. that wasn't the show we were making um and technically they only added sagas of sundry because of uh legal reasons the, the yeah, yeah. goblin mode just by itself is already trademarked <laughs> believe really? it or not I and i don't that. know i don't know who trademarked it but <laughs> you can't name something goblin mode you have to name it like dot -de dot -de goblin mode so we so they just chose sagas of sundry because that was a, like an entity they already they already owned so there there that's some like in the weeds stuff for you but it all was born of bureaucracy uh, <laughs> uh but no I, from the beginning it was like oh do you want to run a, a basically a D, D game for everybody and i was like boy do i um and it it and the building is different like the geography of where we played uh, all very different from the old days and and the future of it is still a big question mark too um obviously i think legendary digital networks wants to capitalize on on this audience that they had built and just hadn't nurtured in a while and this this might this is definitely their first foray into that i think everyone's hoping that this continues but it is it is actually still a big question mark too but Absolutely. as far as my part in it it was just like oh yeah great geek and sundry's back and i'm doing a thing with it yeah great cool i love it yeah, like when, I, when I first put out that video kind of talking about the history of Geek and Sundry, there was such a positive outcry for of people talking about all of the different shows and the personalities. I think it definitely has a future. Uh, and seeing this this show from what I've seen so far, I'm like, this is this is quality. This is incredible. Yeah, and you've done you. an incredible job with it as well as everybody thank else you. on the set. Yes. Um, and then just one last question, uh, a little fun one for the end here. Okay. Uh, when you play D and D, not when you're not a dungeon master, when you're playing, are you more of a minion or are you more of a hero? Oh, please! <laughs> Do you want to answer that question? I, you think I'm giving minion? I'm giving mother. <laughs> I'm giving father. I'm giving the boss. I'm in charge. We're playing. You know, no, I'm a full-on hero. Um, I step into protagonist role like a uh, you know, birthday suit. Like it is, it is where I live, baby. Uh, I I have frustrated dungeon masters for as long as I can remember, and I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. Fair enough. Well, thank you so much for being on here, <laughs> talking about your incredible new series. Uh, if you want to kind of tell people anything more about it, or like if you were to go to find it on any kind of platform, feel free. Oh yeah, uh, it's youtube.com slash, I think at geek and sundry all spelled out. And then if you want to follow me, I'm instagram.com slash I'm at Vorpal sword. Um, that's where I, I, I post most of my stuff. I'm also that on all the socials, but that's where you can find my Discord um, that's popping off with D&D people and uh, and then my newsletter as well that um, is, is kind of, I don't know, first opportunities for DM school went there. So that's all I'll say about that. But yeah, it's a, it's a fun newsletter. It's just monthly and it's um, a little look into my life. That's all. Well, fair enough. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll go ahead and end the recording here, but thank you again and we'll see you guys next time.